I'm not sure I can, can give you so many inside tips on how to communicate sexual ethics into the modern media world, which is the, the, the theme, but I can, I can share some of, uh, some of my own thinking, because in relating to modern media, you, of course, realize very quickly as a Christian that this is a platform where I, I cannot just proclaim the Christian faith, as I can when I enter a pulpit in a church, then I'm giving the, the freedom of just proclaiming, even though I think myself a lot of uh, preachers would do better if they don't, do not only proclaim, but also sometimes argued for the <laughs> message they are proclaiming, but the context gives them the freedom to just proclaim. Uh, but you cannot do that in a, in a media world, and uh, you cannot, uh, you cannot just repeat a traditional position, which you often can do when in conversations with a fellow Christian brother or sister. You can assume a lot of things and you can just repeat, this is what we Christian believe or this is what we Christian think. But you, you cannot do it that way in relationship to, to media. So that has forced me to, uh, to think more about what do I actually believe in terms of sexual ethics and why do I believe it and how can I formulate that so a person who does not agree with me and uh, on beforehand uh, do not understand my position, uh, how, can I, how can I communicate that? So that has forced me to do some kind of background reflection and it, it will be more on that level uh, uh, to invite you into my own reflection over this issue. I like this quote by Groucho Marx. I think sex is here to stay. And, and I, uh, am, I standing, am I standing in the way? That's, so you prefer Groucho Marx for me? Okay. I'm disappointed, Morgan. Okay, okay. Yeah, uh, that was sad, that was sad. I hear the same. Well, that's even worse. <laughs> <laughs> okay, okay, so uh, here we go. I think sex is here to stay, and I, I think it's right. This is not a trend, it's a really a basic fact of human existence, and, and every human being should, I think, make some deep <coughs> reflection about this side of reality. The fact that we are physical beings, that we are uh, human beings in in two versions, male and female, that we are sexual beings and that that is a very powerful and important uh, aspect of, uh, of reality. So everyone needs to, to think about this. And as a Christian, believing that God is the uh, originator and the creator of this area of life, I realized that, wow, before this was in my life, the sexual dim dimension, it was in the mind of God. That's an interesting thought. He, th he thought about it before it was a reality. And he was not ashamed, he did not blush. <laughs> he thought about it, creating male and female and sexual beings. And he thought, yeah, that's good. That is what I will do. And then he created us as male and female. And, you know, some people say, well, uh, Christianity is uh, hostile towards sexuality or negative towards sexuality. No, not at all. If you read the Bible and uh, you start from the beginning and you think about what was the first word God said to human beings? Well, it was actually have sex. That's the first word directed to a human being. Well, to quote it more accurately, uh, <laughs> multi multiply and be be fruitful and multiply and fill the earth. But that, of course, entails you have to have sex <laughs> because that's, that's the way God has created us and that's how we are fruitful. So you, you cannot say that the Bible is negative or hostile or anything like that in those issues. Okay, so we need to do some thinking. <clears throat> when we... Uh, or if I re reflect over Swedish media and some Western media, which is what I uh, 
mainly have the ability to follow. There is, of course, quite a lot about uh, sex. It's actually everywhere. But there's a lot of sex, but at the same time, it's not a balanced uh, information or description of sex. It's nearly always one kind of voices that are heard and that can talk very loud about sex. Voices that promote uh, promiscuity, that uh, promotes the separation between love and sex, voices that promote uh, same-sex relationships, and voices that promote some uh, very radical sexual subcultures, like uh, swingers and that kind of, of stuff. That's regularly in the newspapers. But secular media uh, is just blind to many different perspectives of on sexuality, not only the Christian view. They are totally blind for the Christian view. They never or almost never give a balanced and insightful presentation of this is the way Christians relate to the body and to sexuality. This is their thinking. This is their reasoning. So we are often silenced. But other groups are also silenced. So recently in Sweden, our biggest newspaper, Dagens Nyheter, they've had a series about sex. And very surprisingly, they uh, gave voice to a number of people with very unusual perspectives on sex. Now, it was not Christians, but I really appreciated them to try to break the silence. So, for example, they were giving some attention to uh, people who describe themselves as asexual, just recognizing, actually, I don't have much of a sexual urge, sexual interest, uh, I've never had sex, and I do not want to have sex. I would like to form a friendship relationship with someone of the opposite sex, who have identified themselves as a person basically without a sexual drive. Now, that was a very interesting voice in a culture where everyone is saying sex is the most important thing and you can never be a fulfilled human being without sex and you are stupid or strange if you don't have sex. And suddenly, very seriously, they gave voice to someone describing, well, this is my life. I just found myself this way. Uh, they gave voice to some people who absolutely are not asexual, but for example, persons who have been married for like two decades and then one spouse died, or one spouse, well, their spouse became seriously ill. So they were still married, still living together, but for medical and physical reasons, they couldn't uh, have a sexual relationship any longer. And they gave voice to those. And the um, responses have been really strong. Suddenly, media opened up for another kind of discussion. Now, still they have not uh, opened up for a Christian voice. <laughs> uh, but I found it interesting, but strange that media are so limited in just a certain way of nearly always talking about sex. Now, it was an exception, but, but I hope this will open it. In, in my country, a discussion which will be more wide-ranging than it has been so far. <clears throat> and of course, I think uh, we as Christians, we need to be uh, courageous to step forward and, and actually say we are here, <laughs> we are real human beings, and this is how we think. This is our perspective on life. Uh, this is our contribution, and we actually think this is quite an interesting and constructive way of thinking about sex. When doing that, it's really important to be able to uh, differentiate between moral and legal debates. And here's a lot of confusion, and the media often makes that confusion. 
all laws should be moral. We should not have immoral laws in, in a country. But this is really important. All morals should not be put into laws. <laughs> And we need to make this distinction to say, and if I talk for myself, I'm a proponent of a free, open, in political terms, a liberal society where people have the freedom to choose their own life, their own lifestyles. Of course, there will be some limits. You are not allowed to, uh, to hurt other, other people. And we have to discuss there needs to be some limit. But the basic attitude must be uh, of giving people freedom allowing people to choose their own way of life and not forcing a peculiar lifestyle uh, upon them. But within that free society, we then need to have really good, tough discussions about, of all those possible ways to live, which ways are good and constructive and healthy, which ways are in harmony with who we are as human beings, which way will build a good community, which ways long-term will build strong human lives? So we need to have the moral discussion. So to, just to uh, take a concrete example, uh, uh, which, which relates to uh, same-sex relationships, and uh, I, I guess we will come back to that, that issue. Um, in Sweden, it was decriminalized to have same-sex relationships, 1944. And I think that was a good thing. We should not have police going after people into bedrooms to see what, uh, what adults are doing. Um, human beings are free to make their own choices and live their own lives. One of my, uh, one of the, my heroes in, uh, amongst the bishops at that time, uh, Bouillard, you, you know him, he was one of those who favored the decriminalization of homosexuality in 1944. And I have never opposed that. I am for a free society. But I've been very public in my view on sexuality, uh, homosexual relationships, and same-sex marriage. And I was one of those who opposed the redefinition of marriage and make our marriage laws into uh, uh, gender-neutral marriage law. Because that is another uh, issue. That is not about human freedom. That is, uh, is about what is the definition of marriage? What is the institution of marriage? You have the, you have the freedom to live whatever way you want, but we still need to have a good definition of marriage. So what is a sound, healthy definition of this institution, and why is this institution there? You can give really good arguments for a secular state not to introduce same-sex marriage. Okay, so we need to make a number of those, uh, those distinctions. As a Christian, when I go into those uh, discussions, it's also very important for me to uh, to bring with me a Christian understanding of the relationship between ideal, moral and ethical ideals, and our factual reality. And if you start to reflect over this, as soon as we start to talk about morality or ethics, we will always have a problem. Namely, that there will be a difference between our ideal and the factual reality. The two of them will not match up. So if I say something totally uncontroversial, we should not lie. You should tell the truth. Be truthful. And everyone would say, yeah, that's a good idea. And then if I ask you, have you lied? Well, a few people nod, and the rest of you lied just now. <laughs> so, you know, we have an ideal. Everyone agrees. And then our factual lives are not matching up to the ideal. So then we will always have the discussion what to do uh, to, um, with this, uh, uh, this difference between our ideal and the reality. And that will be like that in terms of our sexual ethics. 
In the church, I think we have been handling sexual ethics very badly in this respect. I think there we, we can see two pitfalls. Uh, the first pitfall, which is, uh, and I, uh, if I take examples from Sweden, uh, will be the pitfall of the Lutheran church in Sweden, the, the majority church. So you have ethical standards from the Bible, and then you have the actual life of people. And then the church have started to say, well, the way to solve this tension is to lower the ethical bar down to the way we actually live. So they have given up all sexual ethics. So now the Lutheran church is not taking a stand on nearly anything, and they are, of course, performing same-sex marriage uh, in, in the church. And they never say anything about sex outside or, or before marriage or about divorce or about anything. So they're just lowering the bar. So there's not much ethics left. <laughs> the other pitfall, which is much more common in what we call the free churches and in different revival circles, is that people hide the difference. Everyone pretends that we all live in accordance with the idea. And that creates hypocrisy and harshness because the big thing is not to be exposed. Because if you're exposed, everyone will get angry and you will be kicked out of the community. So no grace, uh, no support, which is an ugly picture. Now, the um, gospel solution to this is, of course, God's grace, that we can come with our history to the cross of Christ, and we can be cleansed, we can have forgiveness. That's how we solve the, uh, the difference between ideal and reality. And then God's spirit, that God will help us to start a life where we move in the direction of the ideal. Uh, and we approach it, the idea. And that is the gospel solution, God's grace and God's spirit. And I think a lot of media people, they think that all Christians uh, fall into this category. And we need to really show the media. Th this is a chance to actually present the gospel. <clears throat> when, I, uh, when, when I think of sexuality and try to put it in, not only think about what is my Christian view, what is the secular view, I, I like to broaden the perspective to think what have historically been the different ways human beings have been thinking about sex? Of course, many, many, many different ways, but I think you can categorize it into four different groups. What are the different perspectives on sex? One perspective is that people have had a negative attitude towards sex. And you can identify cultures with that attitude, like uh, uh, Plato's perspective. The body is something low, something dirty, something unclean, or a neoplatonic view. We can talk about Gnosticism, you know, rejecting sexuality, the physical, the bodily. We talk about um, uh, asceticism, uh, about the Victorian perspective. So some cultures have tried to say, of course, we need to have sex, but only in order to procreate and don't enjoy it those few times <laughs> because it's, it's dirty. Other cultures have gone in the totally opposite direction of a boundless sexuality, saying, well, Sex, is, it's nothing special with sex. It's like the need of sleep, of uh, food, and uh, it's just a physical need. And you have, have to have it fulfilled, but it's no big deal. Sex is not a big thing. And of course, the Roman, um, the Roman Empire, uh, the, the life in antiquity, a lot of people had this, this attitude. And of course, the secular world has this attitude quite a lot. Here would be high focus on the amount of sex. Be free to have sex, have sex with a lot of people, uh, in a lot of way, 
you know, so the quantity of sex is the focus. The quality of sex, mm. the meaning of sex, it's, it's not a big issue. No one actually knows why we are having all those. Yeah, of, of course, they're a pleasure. It's, it's interesting, but there's no deeper meaning to why on earth do we have sex? So that's a, a second perspective. A third perspective is that some cultures have merge sexuality and religion, sexuality and spirituality, and that is quite common. You can think of all the religions in, in antiquity where temple prostitution were part of the religious worship. You can think of what uh, a lot of the tabloids are, are uh, happy to present of uh, tantric sex, which goes back to Hindu traditions where uh, sexual ecstasy and religious spiritual ecstasy is merged and orgasm is a way of connecting with God, with the divine. So you merge sexuality and spirituality. Um, you can think of a lot of religious sects where things are going really wrong. You know, they always combine uh, spirituality and sex. In my view, really dangerous because it's too powerful forces within the human being and if you can combine them and then have some power over people you can manipulate people into a lot of things okay so that's a, a, a third view the fourth view, fourth view is i don't know what's a good word but i call it a balanced view of sex meaning you are really positive towards sex but you identify a certain area within where you say, here, sexuality should be explored, should be enjoyed, should be expressed. Here it's all good, but there are clear boundaries. And outside those boundaries, what is really good inside those boundaries, take on another fu function and becomes something destructive or selfish. It, it just takes on another meaning. So cultures try to define what is this area. And... and Cultures do not agree, but they try to establish this is the area where it's really good to express yourself sexually. But don't, don't go beyond those, um, uh, those borders. I think it's interesting to reflect over this. Um, and uh, if I look at my, my uh, country, Sweden, we have gone from a kind of mixture of suppressed sexuality and balanced sexuality. Christian roots should have been here, but there have also been uh, a number of forces, I think, that have not uh, really affirmed sexuality in the right way. But that has uh, given way to uh, this view very much. So I come from the country of the sexual revolution. So that's a strange thing to be world famous for. The sexual revolution. It's Sweden and, and Denmark, I think, in, in combination that broke the, uh, broke the wall and opened the door for sexual revolution. It started with this, uh, this movie. It's interesting for your media people. I uh, can recommend it uh, to you. It was a scandal at the time, and you would not <laughs> react for it a second. Uh, well, there is one nude scene. On a distance, you see a nude woman uh, uh, from behind, but it's a distance. And a really scandal, scandalous thing with this early Ingmar Bergman movement, movie. So it was before he was a really world-famous uh, director and making really serious movies. This is a more light, light movie. The Summer with Monica, it's... Um, it's a romantic love affair, um, a young couple uh, just escaping from their social context out in the archipelago in the lovely, uh, on a lovely island in, in the summer and uh, experiencing a love affair. But in one scene, for the first time ever, there was a one-second view of the uh, nipple of the breast of Harriet Anderson. So it broke just a, a, a limit. Everyone had agreed you cannot show a naked female breast on, uh, on a film. And this film uh, broke that. And then the door was open and 
yeah, we know where, where we are today. Uh, it's hard today, you know, used, we are surrounded by MTV videos. It's really hard to understand the shock and the scandal this movie uh, uh, created. Uh, uh, that is, uh, what year? Uh, I don't have that. I think it is in the late. Yeah, they can. Uh, I think it's it's in the late fifties. So it's uh, it's still. Yeah, I think it's before nineteen sixties. But it it uh, opened the door and then it. Uh, then there were a number of other Swedish films. I will not go into them, which uh, went much further, uh, but were shown on on in general cinemas, and they uh, were part of this breaking uh, uh, the way for. A, a new a new time 53. 53 okay that's really early 53 yeah yeah 53 okay so living in uh, living in Sweden uh, it's been interesting for me to make Sweden a case study <laughs> since we were kind of the first countries and, and we have continued to be first in in not absolutely first but we were really early with same-sex marriage for example the whole red redefinition and we've been quite early in in many of the changes in how people think in this area. And you can say that we experience a new freedom, and that has, of course, been the argument all the way. This is an area that needs to be liberated. We need more freedom for people to express themselves, to enjoy their bodies, enjoy sexuality. We need to liberate the whole area of love, of the body, of uh, uh, the erotic, of the sexual. This is a great uh, liberation project. That is how it has been um, uh, uh, presented. And of course, we, uh, freedom is such a lovely word, so we are all, we are all for freedom. Of course, we want freedom. Uh, you don't want to be imprisoned, won't you? Do you? No, we want freedom. So this is, of course, the problem is that there has not been much of a new understanding what to pl put in the, old, in the place of the old paradigm. So the whole emphasis has been on breaking a number of ideas, deconstructing a number of ways of thinking, but there has not been much effort put, uh, put into, okay, but now when all is in ruins, how now should we think? What is the new understanding of sex? And you will not hear many people try to formulate, we went from this and now here is the new understanding of this whole area of life. But the whole movement had been, we need to break loose from the old understanding, uh, to destroy it, to deconstruct it, to come out in the free world. And this is my question to my own culture. Okay, let's define what is the new understanding. And you will not have many, many answers on that. It's, it's just uh, silent. Uh, if I should try to put words on what has happened from someone with Monica to my, my own time, here are some, some way, ways I would try to describe the, the development. We have moved from an ethics of Commitments. So, traditionally, people have said, sex belongs to marriage, and marriage is lifelong. Not that all people in Sweden live like that. Uh, no, they did not. But that was the general agreed ethical framework that was upheld in a general way. So, life, uh, sex belonged to... A, a relationship where we were united for better or worse until death do us apart. That was the basic understanding. And of course it goes back to a Christian understanding of sex and marriage. That was then replaced by an ethics of closeness. People saying, yeah, sex belongs to love, to relationship, to connection, but of course you don't need to be married. You can have sex with someone you fall in love with, someone you're really connected to, but it's not for life. Uh, things can, new things can happen. So as long as we feel love uh, between each other, we can express that love sexually. That has then moved to an ethic of pleasure, of 
lust and mutual enjoyment. So now it's very common amongst young people in Sweden to have friends with benefits. So you have people you play badminton with, so you have an agreement. We play badminton once a week, and there's nothing more in our relationship than we, we are good badminton partners. And then you have friends where the agreement is, uh, it's not a relationship, we're not in love, but we have sex, so we meet in order to have sex. And some of the st statistics here are, are really surprising, that uh, on a high school, up to one third of the students have experience, experiences of uh, having friends with benefits. So it's a total separation of, of love and sex. You don't need a special connection with the person on any level, but just that, that it works sexually. You can, you can have a time of enjoyment. Another way of looking at what has happened is this way. Traditionally, male sexuality has been the norm. So in the past, women were called to be chaste. And the general thinking was, well, sexuality for the, for the man is such an uncontrollable force. So he's excused and, and he will do a lot of things. It's the task of the responsibility of the, the woman to regulate sex so it's not goes overboard. So women should stay uh, chaste, but men are excused. Uh, th that's a horrible perspective, but it was a general perspective. What has happened now is not that men have been addressed, but today a lot of voices are saying, look what we have allowed men to do. Now we need to encourage women to do the same thing. So women should pursue sex like men traditionally have done. And that is a lot of pressure on young women to be sexually active uh, with men as the role model. And, you know, I read so many of, of uh, those people who are educating young people who are pushing this, this kind of argument. And I would say in both case, uh, talking as a Christian here, I would say in both case, uh, the norm here is fallen male sexuality. I don't know female sexuality from the inside. I'm a, I'm a man, so I leave it to you women to describe what is female sexuality experience from the inside. But I know quite well male sexuality from the inside. And I think most of us men would agree that one not so constructive aspect of our sexuality, and as a Christian I would say after the fall, is an inherent tendency to promiscuity. We have an inbuilt ability to separate the object and our sexual, sexual desire, to put our sexual desire as the focus and the thing in itself, and, and, and the object of it is less important. And we have to struggle with that. It's really, a, um, I think, a bad trait within us. And now that is ma made into the norm for, for everyone. What I, the alternative, which very few people talk about, is of course to encourage men to be responsible. And I don't understand in a feministic culture like Sweden, why that is not a main emphasis. It's time for men to grow up <laughs> and start to be more res res uh, have more responsibility for their own sexuality. Or to put it more even better, of course, both men and women, mature human beings, should grow in self-control. As a Christian, I would add, well, that's one of the fruits of the Spirit, to grow in self-control, to control yourself. Another way, and I'm trying to walk around my own culture looking at it from different perspectives, if, if you uh, wonder what I try to do here. Um, you, I think you can say basically sexuality has three different aspects. There is a uniting aspect, aspect. Two human beings are uniting, bodily united to each other. It's a kind of unique um, um, bodily event where two persons unite. And uh, when we are in love and in marriage, we, we, really, we really see the significance of this united, uniting as aspect of expressing our belonging to each other. So there is a uniting aspect. There is the aspect of uh, multiply, 
this is how new human beings come, come into existence. This is biologically the key aspect of sexuality. If you are uh, thinking in Darwinian terms, why are we sexual beings? Well, this is the way we procreate. This is, this is how new human beings come into existence. So that's a major part of, of sexuality if we speak in biological terms. And then when it's performed in the right way, there's a lot of pleasure and joy and, and playfulness and, and, uh, uh, and, and so on. So it's, it's an enjoyable thing. Okay, this is, this is really basic. Everyone knows that these are the three basic, at least three of the basic aspects of sexuality. What's happening in my culture is that we, by and large, just ignore two of the aspects. We just put a blind eye. They are not there. Sex is not, not uniting you with another person. And we do not think about uh, the multiplying side of sex because we think, well, we have uh, contraceptives. So we, and basically, young people, uh, they would think about sex in terms of pleasure, one aspect of sexuality. And then people are surprised when they become pregnant, for example. We have really high figures in terms of abortion. So unplanned pregnancies, between 35 and 40,000 every year in my small country, which is really high figures. And people don't think about the uniting aspect. Have you, I don't know if you've ever reflected over the fact that we have special laws uh, and punishments for rape. And they are distinguished between, uh, from just physical assault. So you have specific laws in, in terms if you assault a person, hit someone in, a, in, in the face, break someone's legs. That, that's one law with certain punishments. Why on earth is not rape just one of those physical assaults? Well, if you look at it, it's, it's a physical assault. You're doing something again with the body of another person against that person's will. So why do we have a separate law? Because everyone knows that in reality, this is a much, much deeper wound for a person. And it's related to this uniting uh, aspect. You read of, of women who have been raped, who they stand in the in the shower for hours because they feel unclean. That's not the, the case if someone had punched you in the, the face. Then you're not unclean. That, that is not the human experience. You're hurt, of course, and you're angry, and you're a lot of other things, but you're not, you do not stand in a shower for hours. So sex is, we know, in this, in this case, we know that sex is a different kind of event of a bodily, you do something bodily with a person, which separates it from other things you do bodily with another person. Now, this is obvious for everyone in terms of the law relating to rape, but no one ever talks about it when we discuss sexual ethics. So we just ignore it as if it was not there. A few years ago, um, the Swedish Time magazine, or the Swedish Newsweek, it's called, uh, Focus, they had a num uh, an issue on sexual revelation, uh, sexual revolution, <laughs> not revelation, <laughs> sexual <laughs> revolution. <laughs> Following up the sexual revolution of, of uh, my country um, and writing about uh, the, the history here, and they, they uh, saw something really interesting. Baby Boomer talked about it. Those born in the 80s implement it. So they saw that in the, uh, in, the, uh, in the 60s and 70s, there was a lot of talk about the sexual revolution. And some avant-garde people uh, lived like that. But the majority of, uh, of the population did not, regardless of all the talk about it. It took some uh, decades before it really was in the whole population. But now, people in the late uh, adolescence or around age 20 on average 
have more sexual partners per year than the corresponding group in the 60s had in a lifetime. Now that is a big difference. People think of the 60s as the sexual revolution. Yeah, it was for a small group and it was in terms of ideas, but not in terms of how people lived, if you take the whole population. Because it takes time for an idea to really penetrate a whole culture. But now the sexual revolution has penetrated the whole Swedish culture. Uh, we are very organized people in, in Sweden. We have statistics about everything. Mm -hmm. I'm uh, eagerly awaiting uh, a new report from uh, Staten's Folkhälsoinstitut. Lars, help me with an English yeah. translation. Uh, yeah, okay. Uh, National Health Institute. 1996, they published uh, statistics of everything you want to know and everything you do not want to know about uh, Swedish people's sexual lives. Uh, so that's 20 years ago. Uh, now, uh, this year or next year, there will come a new national publication with a lot of new surveys. So, so uh, there's a lot of things we don't know what has happened the last, uh, the last 20 years. But 2005, they published um, a lot of figures about young people. Uh, so um, uh, here is a, a report, uh, youth and sexuality. And in the preface of, of this report, they say two overall trends among young people. And it was, uh, it was really clear what the, the two trends were. Uh, <clears throat> The change can be interpreted, uh, so they are discussing the, the, the changes uh, in our culture. The change can be interpreted as one, since a number of decades ongoing dissolution of the romantic love complex governing our intimate relationships. This dissolution is visible both in a change of love ideology, the ideology that links sexuality with love, and in a change in critique of heteronormativity, the heterosexual relationship as the normal and natural starting point. So that's the two big trends among young people. The dissolution, uh, the connection between sex and love is not there any longer. Of course you can have sex when you are in love, or you can have sex in marriage, no one is denying that. But it's very strong to say, you don't need to have love in order to have sex. Sex is a separate thing. And the second thing is, uh, of course, a totally new freedom in thinking uh, of same-sex relationships and an experiment with... Uh, so how to understand myself, am I hetero, am I homo, am I bisexual, what is my own identity? And the figures are uh, starting to become quite different there in terms of maybe not how people will live long term, but in terms of how many people have uh, one or a few same sex experiences. So it becomes much more common to give it a try uh, and, and so I know what it is, that kind of, uh, uh, of reason. <clears throat> I, I said we, uh, we are a country with a, uh, with a lot of statistics. And um, unfortunately, some of the statistics are now uh, a little bit old because we are waiting for this next really huge national uh, uh, statistics coming out. But when I think of the whole area of, uh, of the sexual revolution and, and uh, sexual ethics and how we talk about it, I think it's really interesting to see what, what has been the consequences of the sexual revolution. Uh, in my country, media uh, eagerly can discuss separately the different consequences, but no one in media puts together the whole picture. And, uh, and I think there is a reason for why no one uh, are willing to do that. So you can find a lot of articles discussing, presenting and discussing a certain statistic, but never putting it together with all the other statistics or with the sexual revolution. So you discuss an individual problem, but not re uh, relating it to the bigger story of society. So just very quickly, if you look at the divorce statistics, they are really sad. We are not capable to keep long-term re relationships very well any longer. 
So you compare it, if you take the year 1900, there were less than 1,000 divorces in, in Sweden during a year. 1950, it was 8,000, so still a very limited number of divorces. Now it's uh, uh, 25,000 divorces a year, so approximately it's 50% of all marriages end in a divorce. And of course people are in pain about that. People who, who, who are divorced are saying, I'm sad, I'm so sorry. So it's, it's a pain in the nation that we, we, f we find it so difficult to form long-term, stable, committed relationships. 1996, when they were asking people who were married or were uh, living together, if they have had a sexual relationship with someone outside that relationship, 38% of the men answered yes, that during the time they were married or living together with someone, they had had a third, a, another person. Uh, and it was a lower percentage of the women, 23%. Think about those figures. There's a lot of shame and a lot of pain and a lot of hypocrisy for those who have not ever told anyone but this uh, <laughs> statistician here. You have betrayed the one you are married to or the one you are living together with. If you take sexually transmitted diseases and you take the population in the age between 25 and 49, more than 33% of that age group have had at least one sexually transmitted disease. Many have had several. Chlamydia, which is the most common sexually transmitted disease today and which is quite seriously because it it is, uh, you, you, don't, uh, you don't notice yourself, it, it does not give any visible signs of, uh, often, but long term it can lead to infertility for the women, uh, for the woman. So it's a serious thing and that is just skyrocketing. Between 1997 and 2007 it increased with 239% and there's constant reports about chlamydia. So now they have introduced the chlamydia day after the summer one day all the hospitals are offering free chlamydia tests because this is really expensive for Sweden because now the, in, the number of women who cannot be pregnant are increasing and that is really hurtful for that family and it's really costly then to help them in other ways to, 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 be, to become pregnant. Uh, 96, it was 14% of Swedish men have paid for sex and visited prostitutes. I'm quite sure that figure will be much higher, even though we have this um, well-known law that uh, you are, it's not uh, allowed legally to buy sex. Uh, and I think that's a good law, but it has not get rid of, of the, uh, uh, all the prostitution. And so many Swedes go to Germany or to Thailand and buy sex. So, well, that, that would be interesting to see what is the, uh, what's happening here. Abortion, which is of course linked to how we live sexually. There will, no, will be no unwarranted, unwanted uh, pregnancies uh, if you don't have sex. So 35,000 pregnancies every year are, ends in abortion. One of four pregnancies ends in an abortion. There's so much hurt and pain in figures like that. And everyone agrees. It's, it's a painful situation when a woman is pregnant. The man often just ignoring her. They wouldn't have to take a decision. And uh, regardless of your view of, uh, on abortion, everyone agrees that it's hurtful, it's painful, it's not a small thing to go through an abortion. So my point here is there's a lot of pain following from the way we live sexually in Sweden today. Maybe the, the worst statistics in, is in the st statistics of sexual uh, related crimes. Now, statistics here is very, uh, very difficult uh, to compare, uh, both internally in our own country because there have been changes in, in uh, the definitions of the law. It's very difficult to uh, compare to other countries because there's a lot of factors coming into play. How you define sexual assault, how you define rape. So a number of countries does not define uh, if, it, if it's within a marriage context, it's not defined as rape, which is it is in Sweden, for example. Um, 
and uh, you have the whole question if people are open to uh, report it to the police. And in many cultures, sexual crimes are so shamefully so people are not prepared to talk about it. My country is one of those countries where, where we are more open about it. So the, uh, there are more people actually reporting it. So um, we should be careful with the, with the exact numbers because they are not precise. The only thing I want to look at here is the direction of the figures, in what direction they are moving. And this is, this is so painful. Uh, there is an increase in reported crimes uh, related to sexuality between 1989 and 1998. Sexual offenses increased, the reports increased with 50%. Against persons under 15 years, the reports increased with 61%. Rape increased with 36%. And this continues. So that was uh, up to 1998. So here's just some, some st statistics from some years. Rape increased 12% during 2002. 2006, there was an increase of rape in, in the Stockholm area with 65%. And it was an increase in 54% for the whole of the, co the country. Part of it is more people are coming forward and actually reporting. So I think the increase is lower than 65%. But you cannot deny that there is an increase. 2008, reported rapes against children increased by 40% in one year. 2013, the police in Stockholm are, co are complaining. There is so much rougher attitude to sex crimes amongst the young. Young men are just dismissing. It's not a big thing when they have uh, assaulted women in, in just a horrible way. And the police are appalled by the attitude of the young men. Two of the uh, biggest hashtags, 2009 and 2000, uh, 2013, was one... Hashtag was, we need to talk about it. And that was someone tweeting, saying, uh, have, you, uh, have you ever done any, anything sexually where you actually knew the other person was not really with you? Or have you yourself experienced someone who pressed it upon you? So it was about the gray zone. It was not a rape, but... It was not really a fair situation because you pressed or you yourself pressed into a situation which was not fully okay. And Twitter just exploded. Because so many people felt, yeah, I went over the line. I pressed someone into something I actually knew they were not really willing to do. Or I myself have experienced it. And, and uh, yeah, so a lot of discussion about that. 2013, uh, one woman tweeted out, I was raped and I did not have the courage to report it. Hashtag unrecorded. Whew. Even in Sweden, with, a, with such a high tendency to report, Twitter just exploded. Uh, it was unrecorded. Oh, I'm going... Tell me, oh, 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 sorry for being so slow here. <laughs> okay, uh, then I, uh, oh, we need to, we need to a lot of discussion here, sorry. Uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. The point here is that the sexual lifestyle after the sexual revolution leads to a lot of pleasure. I'm not denying that. And there's a lot of, of freedom. Uh, and it, it should, be, it should be, be affirmed that compared to uh, a lot of the stigma that has been on a number of things sexually related before, now there's a lot of freedom and people experience, of course, a lot of pleasure. But we cause ourselves and other people so much pain. The sexual revolution is not only a positive liberation, but also humiliation and debasement for so many people. And in my view, the sexual revolution is basically a failure, not only from a Christian perspective, but strictly speaking from a utilitarian perspective. Uh, how can we create uh, most joy for, most, for the highest number of people? From a strictly utilitarian perspective, 
the sexual revolution is a failure. And I think we need a better way. And I think the Christian has a contribution here to offer a better way of understanding sexuality. 